This is first in a series of videos about proofs for propositional logic by natural deduction. Uh, in this first video, we're going to cover the general concept of proofs by natural deduction and the first of several implication rules we can use in our proofs. Natural deduction is a proof procedure that allows us to validly derive a conclusion from premises using rules of inference. So it differs in the method from proof of validity or invalidity via truth table. The advantage of the truth table is that it allows us to calculate formally whether an argument is valid or invalid. We can just follow the rules for constructing the truth table and it will give us an answer. The disadvantage of natural deduction is that we have to use creativity or ingenuity to move to different steps of the proof. There is no formula or algorithm we can follow that will just allow us to compute or spit out the right answer. However, the great advantage of proofs by natural deduction is that we can often do them much more quickly than we could proof via truth table. Especially if you have a truth table, for example, with many simple propositions. Each time you add another simple proposition, P, Q, R, S, etc., to the truth table, you double the number of rows that you need in order to complete the truth table. So you're basically increasing the size of the truth table exponentially by adding additional simple propositions. That's one of the reasons why proof by truth table can take a lot of time and calculating power. So natural deduction has the advantage that it can be more rapid than the proof by truth table, even though we don't have that convenient little formula we can just follow. So a proof by natural deduction is a sequence of steps in which each step is either a premise that we're given or the step follows from earlier steps in the sequence according to rules of inference. Rules of inference are what enable us to derive a conclusion validly from premises. The rule of inference leverages the fact that an argument of one logical form is going to be valid regardless of the particular instantiation of that form. So all arguments that share the same logical form are going to be equally valid. Some of the common logical forms are basically given names and rules with our natural deduction system, like modus ponens or MP, as you can see in this particular example. And then we know that all arguments that share that same general form of modus ponens will be valid. So first we have an example argument in the natural language, English, albeit put into standard form. If this is not the new mall, then we are in the wrong place. This is not the new mall, therefore we are in the wrong place. So standard form, we have numbered premises and conclusion last, and a line separating premises from conclusion. Let's see what that argument would look like using a proof by natural deduction. Lines one and two are using a uh, are purely symbolic expression of the propositions. Lines one and two are the premises. Those do not require any proof. We're just given those as assumptions. The conclusion W is listed after a slash on the same line as the last premise. So the parts of the natural deduction proof that are not in bold are what were given initially. Two premises in this case and a conclusion after the slash. Step three is the first, and in this case, the last step of the proof by natural deduction. Some proofs by natural deduction have only one step like this. Many others require multiple steps. In this case, we can get to the conclusion W and only one logical step from those premises. So line three is in bold to represent the fact that it is a uh, step of the argument. It's not something that we're given as a premise. We had to prove that step using the rule of inference modus ponens, here abbreviated MP. So there are two main types of rules of inference, implication rules and replacement rules. Implication rules um, apply to an entire line of a proof only. 
So an example of an implication rule is modus ponens from the previous slide. Another example is modus tollens, which you can see here. Modus tollens allows us to move from two premises, one of which is a conditional, P horseshoe Q, and the other of which is a negation of the consequent of that conditional, in this case, tilde Q. And modus tollens allows us to take premises of that form and then to validly conclude the negation of the antecedent, in this case, tilde P, is true. Replacement rules differ from implication rules in that they can be used either on part of a line or a complete line in a proof. Also, the implication rules allow you to go from one or more premises to the conclusion. Replacement rules allow you to replace parts of an existing proposition in your proof, either the part or the whole. So as an example, let's look at De Morgan's theorem. De Morgan's theorem allows you to move from a conjunction of negations, like you can see in the consequent of the conditional. Uh, if you look at line one, it's P horseshoe, open parenthesis, tilde Q dot tilde R, close parenthesis. The consequent of that conditional is a conjunction of negations, tilde Q dot tilde R. De Morgan's theorem allows you to move or change that conjunction of negations to a negated disjunction, which in this case is tilde open parenthesis Q wedge R close parenthesis. So we've applied De Morgan's theorem just on the consequent of that conditional. It's something we can do with the replacement rule, but not with an implication rule. In this video, we're going to learn uh, the first four of the set of implication rules. Later videos will cover other implication rules and the replacement rules. All of them are used in our proofs by natural deduction. Let's talk about the formatting of a proof by natural deduction. Proofs begin with a set of initial premises. In this particular example, those premises are shown in normal non-bolded text to differentiate them from the steps of the proof that follows. Initial premises do not require justification. We're not proving those. Those are given to us as assumptions. The conclusion is listed after a slash on the same line as the last of our premises or givens. When we begin the proof, all we would be given is the top four lines in this example, the lines not in bold. And then we'd have to figure out, based on those premises, lines one to four, how can we prove that Q must be true, assuming those premises? So in order to create another line of a proof, we continue the numbering from the premises. In this case, we have to go to line five. And we can use rules to prove new things based on the premises. Whenever we do so, whenever we add a new line to the proof, we have to give what's called a justification. The justification is given to the right of each of our new steps in the proof. It names one or more premises that we use to derive that step, and it also names the rule that we use to derive it. So if you look at line five, for example, we're looking at premises one and three to justify line five. Premise one is not R or tilde R. Premise three is R wedge tilde S. Now we can use disjunctive syllogism, one of the rules of inference, to prove based on premises one and three that tilde S or not S must also be true. So that's what we're doing as we complete our proof. We do however many um, steps we need before we get to the final conclusion, in this case, Q. So the proof will always have at least one step. In this case, we needed three steps to get to Q. The proof should always end with the line that's identical to the conclusion, what is listed after the slash. Once you get to the conclusion, in this case Q, you can stop. You don't have to keep on going. You're done. So now we're going to look at the actual rules of inference. In this case, the first four implication rules. Um, one of them is called modus ponens, which you can abbreviate as MP. Listed on the upper left is the generic form of modus ponens, P horseshoe Q. So you have a conditional. You have another premise, P, that corresponds to the antecedent of your conditional. If you have those as premises, you can conclude that Q must be true. So here's a natural language example. 
If the iPhone costs under $1,000, then I will buy it. The iPhone costs under $1,000, therefore I will buy it. The, the um, horizontal line separates the premises from the conclusion. So in the context of a proof by natural deduction, you're going to have two premises corresponding to the two assumptions of modus ponens. One of the premises is going to be a conditional P horseshoe Q, and the other premise is going to be the antecedent of that conditional. The order of the premises can shift. So you might have P on one line and P horseshoe Q on another line that comes later. You can still use modus ponens on those two lines. Another thing to keep in mind is that notice we're using lowercase letters to represent the general form of modus ponens. You could think of these lowercase letters as meta variables. Ordinarily, in propositional logic, we use capital letters to stand as variables that could stand for a particular um, simple proposition. We're not using capital letters here for a very specific reason. The lowercase letters can either stand for a simple proposition, like for example, in this case, the lowercase p could be instantiated by an uppercase p. That would be just a simple proposition. Uh, in the natural language example, that's exactly what we have. If the iPhone costs under $1,000, the iPhone costs under $1,000, that's a simple proposition, which you could symbolize by P, I, or some other letter. But the lowercase p could also stand for a compound proposition and still fit the general form of modus ponens. And this goes for all of our other rules of inference. For example, suppose we had a... Um, a conditional with the compound proposition P and S as the antecedent, then the modus ponens would look as follows. Um, if P and S, then Q. P and S, therefore Q. So whenever we're looking at any of these rules of inference, remember the lowercase letters can be substituted out either for a simple proposition or a compound proposition and still keep the same form. Another example, if P then not Q, P therefore not Q. We've turned the consequent into the compound proposition not Q, but we still kept the overall form of the argument. A second rule of inference is modus tollens. You can abbreviate that as MT. Modus tollens has one premise, that's a conditional. Another premise, that's the negation of the consequent of the conditional. If you have two premises that fit that general form, then you can conclude validly that the negation of the antecedent must be true. So here's a natural language example. If enough people sign up for Netflix, then movie theaters will close. Movie theaters have not closed. Therefore, not enough people signed up for Netflix. Another um, implication rule is hypothetical syllogism. You can abbreviate that as HS. Hypothetical syllogism has two premises that are both conditionals, and one of them has a consequent that matches the antecedent of the other. If you have that on any two lines of your proof, then you can validly deduce from that another conditional, where the antecedent is the same as that of your first conditional, and the consequent is the same as that of your second. In this case, I'm saying first and second. Remember, the order can swap. What's important is that to fit the form, you have two conditionals. The consequent of one matches the antecedent of the other. In your conclusion, those matching consequent and antecedent are going to go away, and you're going to be left with the remaining antecedent and consequent. So here's a natural language example. If I live in Pasadena, then I live in California. If I live in California, then I live in the United States. Therefore, if I live in Pasadena, then I live in the United States. So it fits the pattern because one premise has a consequent, I live in California, that's identical to the antecedent of the other conditional. Um, and then our conclusion takes the antecedent from the first conditional and the consequent from the second conditional to produce a new conditional. Another implication rule is called disjunctive syllogism, which you can abbreviate as DS. So it has two versions. You can use the rule if you have either of these cases. Um, one of the premises is going to be a disjunction, P wedge Q. 
the other premise is going to be a negation either of the first disjunct in this case p or of the second disjunct in this case q when you have two premises of that form you can conclude that the other disjunct must be true here's a natural language example you will either take english or critical thinking to fulfill the writing requirement you did not take english to fulfill the writing requirement therefore you will take critical thinking to fulfill the writing requirement basically the idea behind disjunctive syllogism is that if you know that a disjunction is true but one of its disjuncts is false the other one must be true logically speaking so here's a summary of the first four implication rules that we used modus ponens allows you to go from a conditional and the antecedent of the conditional to prove the consequent modus tollens allows you to go from a conditional and the negation of the consequent to prove the negation of the antecedent hypothetical syllogism allows you to go from two conditionals that have a consequent and antecedent that match to a new third conditional and disjunctive syllogism allows you to go from a disjunction and the negation of one of its disjuncts to proving that the other disjunct must be true so these are the general patterns you should be looking for to apply these implication rules to your proofs now let's look at some sample problems the first few sample problems will have proofs where we're given um, a new line based on premises and we have to determine which logical rule which inference rule was used to justify that line so in this case we have two premises if r then s and not s the conclusion is supposed to be not r we can get to the conclusion not r in one step using those two premises so which rule do we have to use to prove not r from those two premises the answer is mt or modus tollens if you look at the form of modus tollens it has one premise that's a conditional the other premise is the negation of the consequent which is the exact pattern we have here and the conclusion is the negation of the antecedent so just keep in mind those generic forms of the inference rules when you're applying them to a line of your proof you don't have to rewrite out the entire thing on the right you're basically applying that whole concept to deduce your new line of the proof the premises are already written you're just writing a new line which is the conclusion using that inference rule let's look at another example we have two premises again one of them the conditional the other the antecedent of that conditional and we're using those to prove the consequent of the conditional um, even though the conclusion on line three is itself a conditional the main thing to focus on here is that it matches the consequent of the conditional in the first premise so what rule can we use to deduce this the answer is mp or modus ponens because that's the rule that allows you to go from a conditional to proving the consequent of that conditional based on another premise that has the antecedent you'll notice in this case we don't have a simple case of just a p horseshoe q premise one is a more complicated compound proposition however the horseshoe is still the main operator and that's why this fits the general form of modus ponens line one is a conditional line two even though it's a negated disjunction it also is identical to the antecedent of the conditional on line one so it still fits the same general pattern of modus ponens another sample problem in this case we have a disjunction on line one and the negation of one of the disjuncts on line two line three is the um, the other disjunct that we're proving true based on those two premises so what rule can we use to prove the other disjunct based on lines one and two the answer is ds or disjunctive syllogism so if you look at that pattern even though the first line is more complicated than the general case of disjunctive syllogism the second disjunct is itself a disjunction that is not relevant to how we apply the rule we can apply the rule in the same way because premise one still has that wedge as the main operator and premise two negates one of the main disjuncts of that wedge so we can conclude the other disjunct in this case itself a compound proposition m wedge n must be true using disjunctive syllogism
Another example, if you look at those two premises, the first one is a conditional. The second one is a negation of the consequent of that conditional. And then on line three, we're deducing the negation of the antecedent. So what rule can we use to do that? The answer is modus tollens. Once again, in this case, we have more complicated propositions in terms of the number and kinds of operators, but the overall pattern is the same. One premise is a horseshoe. The other negates the consequent of that horseshoe. And as a reminder, it would be the same case if we reverse the order of lines one and two, because the pattern of the premises and their operators would still be the same. One would be a conditional or horseshoe as its main operator. The other would be a negation of the consequent as its main operator. And so we could use modus tollens. Another example. So in this case, once again, two premises, we're trying to deduce a conclusion from them. If you look at premise one, it's a conditional. And so is premise two. And another clue is that the consequent of the first conditional is identical to the antecedent of the second. So what rule can we use to go from two conditionals to a new conditional on line three that has the antecedent of one and the consequent of another? The answer is hypothetical syllogism or HS. So we have a more complicated substitution instance of HS. If you look at our first premise, the antecedent is not a simple proposition like P or Q, but a more complex proposition. It's a disjunction and the first disjunct is itself a conjunction. However, it fits the same general pattern of hypothetical syllogism. We have two horseshoes, one of which has a consequent tilde S that matches the antecedent of the other tilde S. And then we can conclude a new horseshoe, a conditional, that's made out of the antecedent of one and the non-matching consequent of the other. So another example, our first premise is a wedge. Our second premise is the negation of the second disjunct of that wedge. Our conclusion is the first disjunct. So what rule are we using? The answer is DS or disjunctive syllogism. So in this case, we've negated the second disjunct instead of the first, but we're using the same rule. So now we're gonna try a different sort of problem where we're given the rule that we're supposed to use, but we have to write in what it would look like when we apply that rule to those premises. So if you look at lines one and two, we're trying to use modus tollens on those. Line one is a conditional, the main operator is a horseshoe. So, so far so good. And line two is the negation of the consequent of that conditional. In this case, the consequent already has a negation on it. It's tilde open parenthesis, tilde r wedge, tilde t close parenthesis. So in order to negate that, we have to add another tilde to fit the form of modus tollens. If there were no tildes on line two, it would not fit the form exactly. So we have to add another tilde. But what does this look like when we apply modus tollens to lines one and two? What answer do we get? It should read tilde s, the negation of the antecedent. Another sample problem, this one we have two steps of a proof that we have to fill in. Remember, most proofs are gonna take more than one step to get to the main conclusion. We have to do them one step at a time. So let's look at line four, that's the first step of our proof. We're using premises two and three and disjunctive syllogism. If we apply disjunctive syllogism to those lines, what do we get? The answer is Q. We have one premise that negates the first disjunct, P, to create um, a situation where we can infer the second disjunct, Q, must be true. So now that we have Q, we're supposed to use that, line four, and line one to prove line five with modus ponens, or MP. So line one says Q horseshoe R, if Q then R, and line four says Q is true. So if we use modus ponens with those two lines, what could we prove? What would we write on line five? The answer is R, um, because we have a conditional, we have the antecedent Q we know is true, so we can deduce the consequent R must be true using modus ponens. And notice with each step of the proof, we're, lighting, we're writing down the lines we used with the rule. So on line four, we had to write lines two and three to deduce Q because those are the premises we used. 
On line five, we had to write lines one and four with MP because those are the premises we used with MP to deduce R. So it's good to think about strategy when trying to create a proof by natural deduction. As I mentioned earlier, there's no algorithm or general formula you can follow step by step to compute the answer. You have to do some strategizing on your own to figure out how to get to the answer. So a general strategy is to locate the conclusion somewhere in the premises. In this case, the conclusion is Q. You can see that listed on line four after the slash. So where is Q in the premises? You can see it on line four. It's the consequent of a conditional. So sometimes you can work your way back from the conclusion to how you could derive the conclusion with each premise. So you're thinking the conclusion is that consequent. What would I need to prove the consequent of that conditional? The answer is you would need um, the antecedent of that conditional, not P. You don't see not P or tilde P written anywhere directly in those previous premises, but the closest you see is P. So there's your P and you want to strategize, how could I prove not P? Again, this goes back in several steps. Our main goal is to prove Q, that's the conclusion. We see Q in line four. How could we get Q out of that? We could use line four with not P and modus ponens to prove Q. But first we have to get not P on its own. We don't see not P. We do see P, which is one step closer. So if we wanted to prove not P out of line two, how could we do that? The answer is we would need to have not S. We could use another modus tollens with if P then S and not S on a separate line to prove not P, which would get us one step closer to proving the conclusion. But unfortunately, again, we don't have not S on its own. So we have to further strategize. We're working our way backward from the conclusion. So how could we get not S on its own? The answer is in our first premise, not R. So look at lines one and three. What rule can we use with those lines to prove not S on its own? The answer is disjunctive syllogism. Now, you're not always gonna be able to reason your way all the way back to the first step. If that's something you're having problems with, another um, strategy you can do is just honestly to look for patterns of rules, uh, patterns of premises that fit the rules and just try things to see if it leads anywhere. But ideally, you will be able to work your way back step by step from the main conclusion to where you need to begin. In this case, we've seen we need to prove not S using lines one and three. Our proof, uh, our justification for line five is one, three, DS or disjunctive syllogism. Another tip you can do, this is purely optional, is to check off each premise when you use it as a reminder that you've already used that premise. Most of the time you're going to be using every premise to get to your main conclusion. It is possible to reuse premises, but the advantage of checking off premises you've used is it naturally directs your attention more to the ones you have not yet used. Those are the ones you're probably gonna to need to use next. So after we had proven not S, do you remember what the next step of the proof should be? It is to use not S and line two with modus tollens to prove not P. So in this case, we're checking off lines two and five. Those are the ones we needed to cite with our justification to prove line six using modus tollens. So what's the next step of the proof? And once again, we should direct our attention to the lines we haven't used. Which lines don't have a check? It's lines four and six. So we wanna use lines four and six with modus ponens to prove Q. And we will never have to check off the last line of our proof because that is something that we're not using to prove something else. It's what we're stopping at because that was the main conclusion we were trying to derive. In addition to general strategies, like trying to identify the conclusion, this will work for any proof with natural deduction. There's also particular tactics you can apply when trying to um, apply particular implication rules or particular replacement rules. So one tactic is if the conclusion is in the consequent of a conditional, you try modus ponens. Look at this example. 
we have the conclusion after the slash q dot r and we can see it in the consequent of the conditional on line one so we can use modus ponens to derive um, the consequent q dot r from lines one and two another tactic is if you see the conclusion is a negation of the antecedent try using modus tollens in this case the conclusion is a negated disjunction we see that same disjunction in line one and line one is also a conditional conveniently line two is the negation of the consequent of that conditional so we use modus tollens to derive the negation of the antecedent from lines one and two another tactic if your conclusion is a conditional statement itself try using hypothetical syllogism so this is not always going to apply but oftentimes it will you can see we have two premises both of them are conditionals and indeed one of them has a consequent till they are that matches the antecedent of the other so we can use hypothetical syllogism on these two lines to derive our conclusion uh, and you'll notice in this case the conclusion in addition to being a conditional has other operators as well but the main operator is the horseshoe so it still fits the general pattern of the rule hypothetical syllogism and then tactic four is if your conclusion is a disjunct so one part of a disjunction try using disjunctive syllogism the conclusion here is r we notice it's the second disjunct of the disjunction in line two so we can try using disjunctive syllogism with lines one and two the rule fits the pattern because line one is the negation of the first disjunct of line two